Welcome to another presentation in our series, Rereading Revelation. This is presentation number 25 in the series. We are rereading this book, seeking to recover its vision of healing. And the topic <coughs> today is the city. And the topic is a <coughs> part of a uh, series of images that we find toward the end of Revelation. The name, the tears, the earth, we have covered those already. Now the city and yet to come, the nations and a reflection on time. And we are organizing these <coughs> satellite subjects around the name, meaning God and the kind of person God is revealed to us to be. And I have contended that the name should be at the center that the others, as important as they are, are not able. They are <coughs> the, it's the name that controls the story and the proportions that we have here at the ending of Revelation. So, <coughs> in the end, there is a city. And we listed some surprises, surprise of earth, surprise of city, and surprise of relocation, that God relocates to earth. Uh, so we will read again. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, beautified for her husband. So a city, a holy city, a whole city, a healed city. That's what we are seeing here. <clears throat> a renewed Jerusalem. Uh, and then we have later in the same chapter, we have one of the bold angels saying to John, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And in the spirit he carried me away uh, to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. So, there is no doubt there is a city here at the end and there is a, a, an enthusiasm, a kind of relishing of this picture uh, and it is called Jerusalem. So there is a kind of a, a, a throwback, a link to the past, to earthly realities before and to the story of that city uh, and now uh, there is a new, new city here. So. We are then in, a, in the end at this, in a city and not in a garden. So this is a, <coughs> like an illustration of the New Jerusalem. And here there is a, a Cranach's uh, depiction of the garden. And there is a contrast here. Maybe the contrast is more uh, on the face of it than in reality. But there is a contrast. Jacques Ellul, who in my view, has done some very excellent thinking on the subject of Revelation and on the subject of the city and the meaning of the city in the Bible. He makes this observation. What does the fact that it is a city essentially mean? We are in the presence of a series of meanings. The first is that we observe a contrast between the first creation and the second. In the first, God had created a garden for man. Man lives in nature. In the second, he is installed in the city. So let's see if we can <coughs> work with that and make something of it. So why is the city a surprise? Well, it is a surprise because the city has a very bad genealogy. It has a very bad history, its origins is not is nothing to be proud of and nothing to <coughs> to celebrate. So the first mention of city building in the Old Testament is Cain. Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch and he built a city uh, and named it Enoch after his son Enoch. So who built the city? Cain built the city. <coughs> And then we have a little later, from here, this is Genesis 4, here is Genesis 10. Nimrod was the first on earth to become a mighty warrior. 
So here he is a, an expansionist. He is in some ways the first empire builder, you might say. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, and Akkad, all of them in the land of Shinar. That's where Iraq is today in, the, in that uh, area in, in um, Mesopotamia. From that land he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Kala, and Resen between Nineveh and Kala. That is the great city. <coughs> so here we have a city that, isn't, uh, that is named Enoch and we don't know where it was. But Nimrod and Nineveh and, and Babel are cities that still have a footprint in history today. And so, so how ancient is this? This is uh, 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 remarkable because we are, uh, uh, we are uh, looking you know, at, at a history that is really uh, remote. <coughs> but the main point here is that in terms of genealogy, the city, first city builder is Cain, second one is Nimrod. He is not an attractive character and there is nothing then about the city that should be attractive. But these cities are remembered. In the text in Genesis, there is mention of Nineveh. And here is a reconstruction of the walls of Nineveh that from the great days of the Assyrian kingdom. Here is the remains of a palace of Sennacherib, also mentioned in the Old Testament. And the city you see in the background now is the city of Mosul that has been in the news uh, uh, for many years now in connection with the war in Iraq and the complete breakdown of civilization there. So it was quite impressive. One of the people who excavated here was a British by the name of Henry Layard. And he, this was in the, in the 19th century, and here is a reconstruction of what one of these palaces might have looked like. And as you can see, it was very amazing and colorful and impressive. And for me, coming from Norway, where people lived in caves, and if there was anyone here at that time, we are talking now uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred years, a thousand years before uh, our time. So we are talking about uh, 3,000 years ago or slightly less than that. And these <coughs> figures here are also Assyrian figures from Nineveh and Nimrod. This one is in the Louvre. This one is at the, in the British Museum. And these are these winged cre uh, animal creatures have human faces and they are uh, royal <coughs> people from Assyria. And here is a King Sargon with his son uh, Sennacherib. <coughs> so these figures are known in history and they are also mentioned in the Bible. And my point here is just to, to con make some connections about uh, the meaning of the city in Old Testament times. So <coughs> the character of the city, also not so good. <coughs> not just that the city builders are people of ill repute like Cain. Here in Genesis 11, <coughs> it's the Tower of Babel. Then they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves, otherwise we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So here, this is the incentive to build the Tower of Babel and a city with it and a sort of, as a kind of defense measure against God's intent to maybe not do, do that. And here we are later in the book of Daniel. This is King Nebuchadnezzar speaking in the 6th century BC. Uh, at the end of 12 months he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king said, Is not this magnificent Babylon, which I have built as a royal capital by my mighty power and for my glorious majesty. So this are texts giving us a sense of the character of these cities. Autonomy, independence from God, no sense of dependence, pride, conquest, domination, self-sufficiency, and 
Babylon first, <coughs> making my kingdom uh, primary at the, co at the expense of others. So this <coughs> uh, map here is the map of the Fertile Crescent. So we have Babylon here, uh, here in that area. We have Nineveh here. We have the Syrians up here. We have Babylonians here. And these are real cities and remembered cities. And here are some pictures from Babylon. This is a reconstruction of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. It was a very impressive city. It had the hanging gardens that was thought to be one of the seven wonders of the world. <coughs> and here is the actual procession street as it looks today in Babylon, even though I imagine some more damage has been done to this area. And <coughs> here at the end of this procession street, there is the Ishtar Gate. If you want to see it, you can. It's here in the B museum in Berlin because the person who excavated Babylon was a German and he <coughs> managed to to cart off some of the things and here is my wife Serena uh, and we are in that museum and it has special meaning for her because she grew up in Baghdad uh, just uh, just a hundred kilometers north of that city of Babylon and here you can see the artwork that lined the procession street in um, in Babylon it was really really impressive as you can see here and you can see the human figures and see that this Ishtar gate was quite quite monumental so that's 2500 years ago it's quite amazing <coughs> so but it is not <coughs> You know, these are cities of the past. We remember them, but they are not there anymore. And then uh, Jacques Ellul, we will read what he says about the meaning of the city. But all these cities he constructed, that human beings constructed, were marked by the same stamp, power. The life of a powerful city is but a constant succession of revolts against God. Her life is the normal result of her origin and development. So to think now that there is a city at the end is a little strange, maybe counterintuitive, because the track record of the city in human civilization is negative. The city uh, uh, built the first one, built by the first murderer, and subsequent cities built by conquest. Notice <coughs> that the that what we're talking about in the ancient world is not nations. They are city-states that expand. And this city is the core element in these, uh, what you might call nations by our criteria. I wish I didn't, uh, shouldn't show you this, but I will. And this is from uh, Syria. And why they would do it, because these are the perpetrators proudly showing off how they treated enemy people. When I first looked at it, I thought these are figures that have been hanged, but they haven't been hanged. They have been impaled. That means that they have had something pushed into their bodies from below, and they are killed in the most cruel, gruesome way that you can imagine. These are Assyrian images. Or this one, <coughs> also from Assyria, these figures here, human beings, they are being flayed alive. It was very cruel. And they show it off as though this is something that they can be proud of. And you can imagine their children walking down the, these uh, streets and seeing what their country is doing. So <coughs> here is what what uh, Elil says about it. Yes, we talked about the power uh, part, and I have one more image here. So that is the image of, of conquest here with the uh, warriors, and there is a, b a bow here, and, uh, and this is a, uh, an instrument of war. And we see a bow in Revelation, and I have attributed that bow of the rider in Revelation seal sequence 
uh, as not belonging to God. So, <coughs> uh, so we <coughs> can one more uh, one more city then to remember is the Rome, because Rome also began as a city state. If you think about the United States, you know that Washington D.C. is the capital of the United States, but you do not think of the United States today as a city-state that originated in Washington, D.C. It surely didn't. Maybe you could say that <coughs> London in England and the United Kingdom also is a country. It's not a city-state even though there are capitals in these nations. But Rome was another, uh, maybe the last of the great city-states. And again, what so the power of Rome is amazing, but Rome's self-depiction is as an ironic, good, you know, fertile, prosperous country, and the goal of all these images was to project onto future generations the impression that they lived in the best of all possible worlds in the best of all times. That is the propaganda, the imperial propaganda. But reality, as in this depiction of the Emperor Hadrian in the second century, might be different. He has his heel, his foot, on the head of a conquered, uh, conquered nation, a conquered person, and here you can see it. So the imagery is an imagery of being a benign influence in the world, and reality is something other than that. <coughs> so Jacques Ellul looks at all of this and he says that the city is a history of failure. Man had never succeeded. He had always experienced failure. And the actual urban monstrosity, and I think this is Cairo, and a picture I have taken myself of air pollution in Cairo, and the actual urban monstrosity is testimony to this. And <coughs> thus, that which had been now to the theology here, that which had been the historic failure of man becomes the triumphant success. There is finally communion, there is finally assembly, and not only of one generation but of all. So the contrast then, these cities that were created by, by negative, by, by uh, what should I say, by the villains of the history. Those cities <coughs> ended in failure and, and so maybe with our, the cities in our time as well. But that symbol, the city symbol, is itself redeemed and human failure is turned around by God, the grace of God, the power of God, because at the end there is a city. And here you can see that we are, we are in, <coughs> in some predicament in our time with the largest cities in the world. Now Tokyo, 37 million. Delhi, 28 million. Uh, I have not been to any of these except Cairo, 20 million. And I have flown out of Cairo by night and seen the lights there, this enormous city of 20 million people with enormous urban problems uh, and just no, uh, no uh, remedy in sight. <coughs> so <coughs> looking then in more in detail of the city in Revelation's vision, you see theological architecture. You have theology reflected in the material elements of the city. It has the glory of God and a radiance like a very rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It has a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gate 12 angels, and at the gates are inscribed the names of the 12 tribes of the Israelites. So here you have city remembering something and also bringing to completion what also in the Old Testament story is a, city, a history of, of failure. It didn't succeed. And the wall of the city has 12 foundations 
and on them are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So here, architecture vouchsafes theology. Uh, the city lies foursquare, its length the same, same as its width, and, the measure, and, and he measured the city with his rod, 1,500 miles, it's very big. Its length and width and height are equal. <coughs> so this is very, this is cubic, like a cube. And to think it would be that wide and that uh, 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 long, that's thinkable. To think that it would also be that high is very odd. So this is theological ar architecture. What is being depicted here is what? What is it in the Old Testament that is cubic in shape? It is the most holy place. It is that territory inside there where it's most, where the most holy is and you can hardly enter it. But now in the city to come, the all of space has become the most holy place. That is to say, it has broken down the line of demarcation between secular space and sacred space. All space has now been made sacred. That is such an important point that I'll try to show you an illustration in a minute. The wall is built of jasper, while the city is pure gold, clear as glass. So it's value, there is beauty, but above all there is theology. There is the story of what God has tried to do in the history of in the Old Testament and in the New Testament with the Twelve Apostles. How is that for a summary? How is that for to imprint theology on the way things are built? <coughs> Let's look some more. Uh, yes, these are just the same statements, but the clear as crystal here, the clear as glass here means transparency, uh, and these symbols are also <coughs> meaningful. So, <coughs> Just to throw in a little uh, digression here on theological ar uh, architecture, this is in the city of Cordoba in the south of Spain in what to me is uh, the most, <coughs> probably the most beautiful house of worship I have seen. This is the uh, uh, outline of the Mesquita, which was a huge mosque, this whole thing, and then a church was built in the 16th century inside the mosque after the Christians reconquered Andalusia, the southern part of Spain, in 1492. But here we are inside, and you see that the building has a lot of light, and the people who built this <coughs> building, the builders of the Mesquita, they tried to create an illusion of when you are inside, you are outside, and when you are outside, you are inside. They, they planted palm trees leading into the building, and inside the building, they wanted to make it seem like there were palm trees inside the building too. Their goal was to obliterate the line of demarcation between sacred and secular space. They wanted to s make the transition very unnoticeable that you live in, that the sacred space diffuses into secular space. And secular space is really not secular anymore. It is sacred space as revelation envisions the world to come to be. We do not distinguish between secular and sacred. No temple in the city. The whole city is a temple. <coughs> and and uh, of course, this is only partial, uh, partially successful, needless to say, but it is a contrast to Christian architecture, because in the Christian architecture, as exemplified in the church, quite an ugly church, I have to say, that was very <coughs> uh, badly built inside the mosque later, the distinction between secular and sacred is a tenet of of architecture, of Christian art architecture, to distinguish rather than to 
to wipe out that, that distinction. And I think that on that point, uh, uh, the theology goes in favor of Islamic uh, theology. <coughs> so here we see community, city as human community, as a divine human community, and we see God's unmediated presence because you don't need to go to the temple to find God. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God. Uh, is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the, is the Lamb. So here there is illumination and presence both. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. And night and darkness are elements of evil, elements of uh, sort of confounders. And here we have uh, the end of that. <coughs> so just to look at this and say here is the symbol, the city, uh, and uh, here we have city, we have bride, we have wall and gates, we have foundations. And all of them, as the primary meaning, refer to people. City of people, bride as people, wall and gates people, apostles and, and, and the Old Testament, and foundation as people. So the meaning here, of course, since it's a city, is that we also have to think in terms of history and culture. As bride, we have to think of intimacy and consummation. As wall and gates, we have to think of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel and foundation here, the twelve apostles. So there is a primary meaning, all of them people, and here are these extended meanings that we have to look at. So again, with a statement from uh, Jacques Ellul, who has done more serious thinking about this than, than most, Consequently, thinking about the city of the world to come, consequently, the history of humanity is not in vain. The fact that God makes a city in the end means that the history of humanity is not in vain, annulled by a stroke of the pen, as if nothing of our efforts, our suffering, our hopes had ever existed. On the contrary, all is gathered up then man is saved with his works. Paradise is not a formless cloud, a rose and a blue fog, a non-place. It is a good city, a solid place, where the whole creation of man is recreated. Now that is a radical thought, that you come and it's, yes, we come to a new earth, earth renewed. We come to a city, a city renewed. But those are elements of the past, now safe, safeguarded, as it were, and brought back to us, ennobled in the world to come, in the present. The twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve apostles, you get the picture. So, uh, <clears throat> so we have, we have then God taking this symbol of human failure and redeeming it and making failure, turning failure into success. So, <clears throat> so a little statement that all is gathered up I think should give some comfort to our people and to how we live and how we see the world. Is it all going to be discarded? Is there nothing that is worth preserving? Surely, surely what will be preserved may be a bit more beautiful uh, than the Sydney Opera from outside or from inside here. But it's not, not like human civilization counts for nothing and the materiality depicted in the world to come is something to take seriously. God does not annul history and the work of man, but on the contrary assumes it. There is something to be said for that. 
and for the music and for the experiences that we have even in this life. And I <clears throat> just love to show you a picture of a man that I count as my friend. This is Herbert Blomstedt, the Swedish conductor who still now in his 90s performs music for the major symphonies in the world, including the, <coughs> the Sydney Opera and, and, and many other uh, places, and who delivers music and thinking of it as a ministry on God's behalf. Let the music in the world to come be heard in the present. And I said when I was <coughs> attending his 90th birthday, uh, I gave a little speech and I said the rest of us, like me as a doctor, uh, I will need to be retrained for the world to come because there will be no need for my skills. But that he doesn't need to have that kind of retraining because he can just continue on as a conductor and everything he has done in this life uh, will be in demand in the world to come. And then I said that my highest wish uh, for my future will be to play an instrument in his orchestra. And he just wrote to me and asked me <coughs> which instrument it would be if I, if I have started practicing. <laughs> and I, I said it will be a... a, 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 a I, I, will, uh, I haven't decided yet, but, but it, I am going to think of it as a, either flute or clarinet or something like that. I'm working on it. <coughs> In the end, there is a contrast between two cities, and this is not surprising, because there is a city that comes to grief, and this is the city that doesn't come to grief. And the way Revelation contrasts these cities is quite amazing. Now here, in this passage, Revelation echoes uh, Jeremiah, uh, and this is <coughs> what uh, the way the text plays out in Revelation. And the sound, this is Babylon, the failed city. And the sound of harpists and musicians and flutists and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And traders of any trade will be found in you no more. And the sound of the millstone will be heard in you no more. And the light of lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. These are very evocative terms for a city that falls silent, a city that comes to grief, a failed city. But here, this city is not a failed city and everything continues. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of a lo loud thunder. And the sound that I heard was like harpists harping on their harps, playing their harps. But the Greek has harping, harpists harping on their harps, and playing their harps is the meaning of it. And I saw those who had won the war standing on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And then this one, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. The harps fall silent in the failed city of humanity. But the harps continue on in the city of God, the renewed Jerusalem, playing harps, playing harps, and there is bride and bridegroom to show that the story, the consummation here, makes the end of the story better than if the bad things really even hadn't happened. So <coughs> the city then is a symbol of community, of successful uh, community, of conviviality, living together in a very harmonious and mutually meaningful way. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord in Psalms. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. How very good and pleasant it is when, uh, when kindred live together in unity in these psalms where the city is a gathering place and you like to go there. And here in Isaiah, in the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains. 
and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream into it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. So this is how it ends. <coughs> and it ends then with a wedding scene. And that is a shared territory between the Old Testament and Revelation and the Gospel of John. And John in his Gospel and Revelation attributed to John play on the same, play the same tune. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom groom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. And this is Jesus speaking to John the Baptist. He who has the, no, John the Baptist speaking of Jesus. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. And then this one, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. That's how it ends. Perhaps this would be okay for me to share a quotation from my own book, my commentary on Revelation. And I am commenting now on the term from Shakilil, all is gathered up. Can this be true? In the world to come, must not Bach be supplanted by more melodious music? Michelangelo by paintings more exquisite. Milton by poetry more sublime. Or Einstein by superior insights into the workings of the physical world. Will there not be buildings uh, more splendid than the Mesquita, the great mosque in Cordoba that sought to blur the line of demarcation between secular and sacred spa space? These are the questions. Perhaps, I say, or probably, or even certainly. But Elil's perception that all is gathered up should not be dismissed. <laughs>